You mentioned the acorn analogy that an acorn mm -hmm. is pre is programmed to grow up into a tree. Yes. Um, if if things are directed how God wanted them, then why did He direct me to love women mm -hmm. as one loves men? Mm -hmm. So this is a really difficult question for a lot of Christians to answer, mainly because we don't want to be. We don't want to come off as insensitive or judgmental. If you're one of these Christians that um, really struggle with this question and and, and uh, have a hard time understanding it or, or answering it, I think this video is really going to help you uh, learn how to answer this question. How do you know God directed you to do that? Right? And there are a lot of things that go on in this world that all of us have. All of us have certain orientations to things we ought not do according to God, but yet we still do them. That's why we live with a fallen nature, right? All of us have a fallen nature. Um, should we expect that in this fallen world that God would give us a nature that wasn't fallen? No. No? So we're all struggling with sin. That's why we need a Savior. Because but everyone, you and me and everyone in this room, needs the sacrifice that Christ provided. Regardless of what our feelings are, regardless of which way we're directed, based on nature or nurture. And as you know, there's a big debate over how much is nature, how much is nurture, uh, for all of our sexual orientations. But are my feelings inherently wrong to have? Are feelings inherently wrong to have? I don't think there's a way you can be blamed for having feelings. Look, I have feelings all day that I ought not act on. And sometimes I fail. But it's not the feelings that are the issue, it's the action that flows from them. Actually, though, if you look at what Jesus said, when you, when you look at Matthew chapter 5, Jesus actually ratchets up the standard. He says if you're just angry with your brother, you're guilty. Well, thanks, Jesus. I don't have a prayer of living up to that, and I don't. He says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. I can't do that. You can't do that. Nobody in this room can do that. Who can do it? Only he can. That's why we need him. So we all have these struggles, Sammy. I have struggles. You have struggles. But for us to say that God's at fault for these struggles. No, God's not at fault for the struggles. I don't believe that. Right. You don't believe what? I don't believe that he's at fault. I think we right. all make mistakes. But I don't think something so like something like love that's supposedly pure it can be pure in the way that a man loves a woman or a man loves a man or a woman loves a woman. Who's to say that the way you love your wife mm -hmm. is any different from the way I'm going to love someone in the future, whether it be a man or a woman? Well, it's not me to say anything because I'm not the moral arbiter of the universe. That's true. Right? So I'm, I, I don't decide right and wrong. This is why when people come to me and say, well, don't impose your morality on me, like I said earlier, I said, this isn't my morality. I didn't make any of this up. In fact, there were things I wish were different, but I'm not the general manager of the universe. I'm not God. So I guess back to your, your question, you'd have to define exactly what you mean by love. What, is, what does love mean? Can you care for somebody of the same sex? Of course you can. I do. The question is, should you go further than that into some sort of romantic relationship? That's the question. I think you should. Well, okay, you can take that. You're, it's a free country. But scripturally, if you believe in the scriptures and if you believe in natural law... Define natural law. Natural law is the idea that everybody intuitively understands moral right and wrong on the big issues. That there's a natural design to us, there's a natural design to the universe that we're intended to go in a, a particular direction and that we know we're supposed to shun evil and we're supposed to seek the good. So, and you think that natural law was founded by, like, Christianity? No, 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 no. It existed long before Christianity. That's founded why, for example, Noah, the entire generation of Noah was judged. They didn't have any scripture, they didn't have any Bible, but God expected them to know basic right and wrong because he had written it on their hearts. So you don't need the Bible to know basic right and wrong. Everyone already knows it. Now, we can suppress it. We can reject it. We can go our own way, and all of us do on occasion. But it's still there. I really feel for this woman here because it seems like she's trying to figure this question out. She's not, she's not interrupting. She's listening. She's thinking. She's responding to Frank. Seems like she's really trying to understand why the feeling is wrong. 
Now I want to play a video of Pastor Vody Bakum to better explain why it's wrong. And if there is such a thing as right and wrong love, and expand a little bit on the idea of, or on the concept of love is love. We must reject the lie that says there is no love that is out of bounds. Because ultimately, that lie that says there is no love that's out of bounds is a lie that says there is no truth in God. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. You see what's happening here? This do not love the world is not God saying, listen, there's good stuff out there that I want to keep from you. That's the lie of the serpent. This do not love says that looks good to you and may even feel good to you. But in the end, you will perish. I'm calling you away from it because I actually do love you, and in loving you, I want you to abide in God, to remain in God, and to not perish. Love can be sinful. Remember, I told you this is an important word for our day. Love can be sinful. We live in the midst of a culture that needs to hear that. It needs to hear that from us. Because it's, it's coming at us with this whole love is love mentality. And, and how can you be against love? Nobody can be against love. Certainly Christians can't be against love because God is love and we are called to love. Therefore, how can you stand in the way of any two people who love one another. But our text today makes it very clear that there are instances when love can be sinful. In other words, this is more than just a theoretical, theological discussion for us to have. This is a very practical, rubber meets the road issue. This issue of love being sinful. The question is, what makes love sinful? What could possibly make love sinful? Under what circumstances would love be considered sinful? Well, first of all, love becomes sinful when it is directed at the wrong object. Love becomes sinful when it is directed at the wrong object. Look at verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Do not love the world. Now, it's very important to note that this word world, especially in Johannine literature, is used in at least three different ways. First of all, the world can refer to all creation. You see this in John 1, John 3, John 4, John 6, John 7, John 8, over and over again. This word cosmos refers to all the world, to all the created universe. John is not saying here that we should not love this universe, this world, it, it, this earth that God created. That, that's not what's being said here. Secondly, the term world refers to the people that inhabit this world that God created. And God is not saying, do not love people, do not love mankind. Absolutely not. We, 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 we know that it doesn't mean that. Because of the love that we're called to give, even to our enemies, the great commandment, love the Lord 
your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. So John can't be talking about that first world here and he can't be talking about that second world here. That would be a contradiction. However, there is a third use of the term world. And that third use refers to the spiritual realm that is in opposition to God and in rebellion against his kingdom. It is that third sense of world that is being discussed here. So when John says, do not love the world, he, he says your love becomes sinful when it's directed at that system that is anti-God, that system that is anti-kingdom, that system that is satanic. Love becomes sinful when it arises from the wrong source. Not only when it's, when it's pointed in the wrong direction, pointed toward the wrong object, but when it arises from the wrong source. Verse 16, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. So, so there's a problem first with the object, and now here there's a problem with the source. But finally, and ultimately, and most importantly, our love becomes sinful when it produces the wrong fruit. When it leads to the wrong ends. Look at verse 17. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Here you have these, these, these two opposite ends. On the one hand, you have this world that is passing away. And on the other hand, you have our God who abides forever. Love becomes sinful when it leads to wrong ends and produces wrong fruit. Our passions become sinful when they are pointed in directions that lead to death and destruction as opposed to leading to life. The poignant way in which this is so pertinent to our times because of the love is love crowd, particularly in the area of same-sex marriage. How, how can you be opposed to same-sex marriage when same-sex marriage is just about people who love each other being allowed to express that love? But that's a love that's pointed at the wrong object. That is not a love that comes from God or that brings glory and honor to God. It is pointed at the wrong object. It is a love that arises from the wrong source. Look with me, if you will, at Romans chapter 1. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and the unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up to the lust of their hearts to impurity. Here we are. These lusts, these desires to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves 
because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Dishonorable passions. The desires themselves are dishonorable. If a man comes to me talking about a desire for a woman who is not his wife, I'm not going to tell him to just go ahead and embrace the desire because the desire in and of itself is okay. It's not. Normally can- people are just trying to make the point that all forms of love are equal and valid. It doesn't matter who's involved or what gender or age. It doesn't matter as long as someone is feeling value or getting some sort of gratification, sexual gratification from it. Love is love, right? But not necessarily the case. For an instance, if a married man is in love with an, with another woman other than his wife, I wouldn't tell him to act on that love. Love is love, right? Not necessarily, right? We can all agree that if an old man is in love with a child, it's morally appalling. But if love is love, where do we draw the line? C.S. Lewis talks about four different kinds of love that we see in the Bible. The first being storge, which is the affectionate love. And there's philia, which is love for a friend. Eros, which is romantic love. And agape, which is a charitable love. Agape being... The love that God has for us. With that being said, we have different kinds of love for friends, kids, wives. So, not all love is love. So, we're going to be ending this video right here. If you guys got some sort of value from this video, make sure you like and subscribe for more Christian content like this. We'll see you in the next one.